All right, well, I guess let's start. Um, so, yeah, last week we got quite a bit of press about this uh, uh, research project that uh, we worked on um, over the past, what, eight months? Eight, eight or nine months? About, yeah, five or six, I'd say. Five or six months, yeah, yeah. cool. So, um, yeah, it was really, uh, it was honestly like um, really interesting stuff to see how the, uh, the fires that occurred in British Columbia last year really had an effect on just all of the, the subsequent natural events. I think we can call them natural disasters, you know, uh, insane amount of uh, flooding and mudslides that occurred along the highways and just uh, uh, the flooding that happened in Sumas Lake. Um, and yeah, it was pretty, pretty wild year. And it was good to see that our team jumped on board to kind of tell the story of how that can happen. Um, and uh, yeah, let's, I'll, I'll pass it on to you and kind of, maybe you can tell me a little bit about what, uh, like, was this known? Like, was this known in the scientific community that these, these events kind of, that these events are interlinked um, or is this more of a new idea? I'd say it's certainly not a new idea. Um, nothing, you know, we're not we're not doing, you know, cutting edge, uh, you know, science here in terms of uh, new discoveries. I guess um, mm -hmm. it's 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 studied in the science scientific community, and it's known about that uh, burn scars can contribute to landslides, and they can contribute to to the flood risk. Um, uh, so yeah, none of that's no, that's new. Um, and I don't think it's being heavily discussed. I have found some news articles that were relating the, the um, during the course of this, found some news articles that were relating uh, the, the fires to the flooding, but uh, not not a ton that I could find. Yeah. And what's the end goal? Like to me, what, I would, what would be amazing is if we had enough machine learning uh, enough data to be able to say, okay, well, we had fires in this area and we use satellite imagery to be able to determine like how, how big the burn scars are and then use sort of predictive weather analytics, which is <laughs> impossible at this point, but um, uh, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to get a better sense of, you know, what could happen in the future and then, and then try to figure out almost in real time that, you know, what would happen if there was a, uh, another atmospheric river in this area, which areas are going to be affected, which properties are going to be affected, which roads are going to be affected the most. Um, so is that kind of, is that in, a, are we getting close to that? Where are we in our ability to be able to be able to do that? Uh, I'm, I'm not certain how how far along um, you know the state of the art is in in regards to that, but that is kind of the end goal of this type of work, right? Is to to be able to not only um, you know monitor things and not only to to do these sorts of studies, which are really kind of qualitative in terms of you know looking at spatial correlations, but actually uh, be able to model. Um, scenarios and model mm -hmm. um you know uh, risk or exposure to risk um and i think that's that's what we where we'd like to get uh within the company and we're not there yet this is just mm -hmm. kind of one piece of the puzzle but um i believe you know it, it i don't i'm i'm skeptical of being able to like with 100% accuracy, predict these things, but I, mm. I do believe that we can make progress and uh, and certainly have uh, a lot more information about the landscape and, and potential risks. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. Let's jump into it. Um, let's take a look at the the story map. Sure. I will just present my screen here. Uh, let me know when you can see that. And I might turn off my camera just because my network can be a bit funny. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so uh, can you see the screen? Uh, yeah. yeah, we're okay. good. Okay, perfect. 
Yeah, so, um, yeah, I guess I'll just say quickly that I'm, I'm Gordon Logie, um, data scientist at Spark Geo, and I kind of did uh, the principal investigation uh, behind this story map, uh, talking about wildfires and flood damage. Uh, but of course, it was a team effort. Many people contributed uh, in a variety of ways, and they're acknowledged at the, the end of this thing. So obviously... Yeah, shout out to Natalia, Raj, uh, who else worked on it? Uh, we had we had Relita, um, we had uh, we had uh, Jonathan. Uh, nice. Actually, I'll go right to the bottom and I'll say we've got Natalia, we've got James, Relita, Jonathan, Kayla, Chloe, and Raj, uh, who all all made contributions to the work. So shout out yes. to them. Shout out sure. to them. Um, go back <clears throat> to the top here. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, basically, uh, the impetus for this project, um, Spark Geo is, of course, an environmentally conscious company, uh, and we've been concerned with the rise in, in climate-related disasters that we've seen in recent years. Uh, we're also a company that's primarily based out of British Columbia. I myself live in, in Alberta, but um, it is a BC-based company, and as such, uh, the, the climate, you know, I guess, Use the term disasters in 2021 uh, that occurred hit you know quite close to home, um, and so you know we're also a geospatial company, so of course we wanted to see uh, how geospatial tech could help us understand any uh, the disasters themselves and any linkages between them. So as I was saying at the beginning, um, <clears throat> this is an understood thing that uh, wildfires can enhance risk of flooding as this uh, this kind of infographic from the National Weather Service depicts. Um, so this happens in a couple of different ways. Uh, perhaps most obviously when a fire goes through a forested area, it burns down the trees, it burns down the understory vegetation. Ordinarily when you ha would have rainfall over these areas, um, you'd have uh, kind of a it would intercept the rain, so the canopy would, the understory would, uh, and it would slow it down. As well, the soil itself would be absorbing some of that water, um, and the remainder of it, of course, would be running off into, into the rivers. But what happens when it all burns down is we get rid of that vegetation layer, but also uh, the, the leaves and, and the plants and the understory um, actually release chemicals that create this, uh, it's a hydro, hydrophobic layer. It is a mm. soil crust that forms and it, it actually prevents that. It's, it's like pavement. So instead of the water uh, infiltrating into the soil, it just runs off directly into the, uh, into the river. So consequently, what you get out of that is that um, there's a lot more water entering the river and it's entering faster. And mm -hmm. so in addition to just a higher volume, of water in these rivers, you have these these larger pulses uh, of high flow, which can be quite damaging. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, in late June in 2021, uh, there was this heat dome, uh, which was a severe uh, heat wave that hit the Pacific Northwest, um, and it you know, is, is quite devastating, um, you know, resulted in indirectly or directly uh, hundreds of deaths uh, and also a lot of uh, animal mortality. Uh, and the other thing that it did was it provided very warm and dry conditions, which were the perfect uh, conditions to fuel uh, wildfires. And so we had the third worst wildfire season on record, but it was also notable because it was a lot of these fires were in the southern BC area, um, and so they're burning close to, you know, some of the major populated areas in the province. Mm -hmm. So here we have um, some of the fires that we mapped. Um, you can see. So these are all of them, just the major ones. Yeah, we 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 kind of limited um, limited to some of the larger ones, uh, but there are, you know, I think we get most of them here. Um, but uh, we did have some factors in terms of like minimum size and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's see, where am I? 
So we map these fires using satellite imagery, both in terms of the extent, so the, the, the kind of area that we can see here, um, and also the severity of the burn. And the severity of the burn is important because um, more severe fires can cause a greater amount of that hydrophobic soil layer, like I described, so it makes the effect worse, but also it can last longer. So years down the line, those more severely burned areas are going to still have some of this residual um, resi residual soil layer, whereas um, you know less severely burned areas may have fully recovered or mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes recovered. Can we uh, detect the severity of the burns pretty accurately or is it somewhat guesswork? Is it like, can we do it using models and code or do we still have to like observe it ourselves? Um, it's always good to have kind of a, a, a ground truth to actually like people going out into the field and taking a look and, and tying these back to the satellite mm -hmm. data because it's always going to be an estimate. Um, I, I'd say that it's, it's tricky and I'm by no means an expert on, on, uh, fire burn, uh, mapping. So I'll try not to embarrass myself here, but you're yeah, also very humble though. And you're constantly <laughs> diminishing your work. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm new to this. Yeah. So <laughs> just for the, for people listening, uh, you're, you're, you're very humble. So. <laughs> That's why I'm asking questions. Like, how how good are we? Because I think we're better at it than than you than you usually make it out to be. And I appreciate the, like the scientific approach of never never using 100% certainty. Can you hear me? Uh no, you broke up a little bit. What about now? I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, there's some funny business with my headset. Um, uh, so just let me know if it sounds like I'm not if you can't hear me anymore. Um. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, we can map these things fairly accurately. This is, this is um, the satellite based method um, is, is fairly standard within remote sensing. Like it's been done for many years. And so yeah. it's well established. Like this isn't, this isn't like a, a super novel approach to this. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And it, and it, ties back to the severity quite well, but it depends on the area and there's other factors uh, at play like like vegetation can um, can be a factor and um, you know seasonality of the imagery and that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and so there's there's things that you need to control for and and we you know we're we're gonna strive as well to make to make this this better and more automatic. Um, as as we move along, mm -hmm. um, I think the results we have here are are, are quite accurate. But it's uh, you know we did also take a look at them and and make sure that it that it made sense. Um, and sometimes though there would be issues. Sorry, I I I can't hear you right now. We're trying to cross reference with actual data on the on in the field as well. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so let me just see where I'm at here. Um, so we can see with the satellite data we've got um, the this is a Sparks Lake fire, which was the biggest fire of the season. Um, and uh, we can see we used Sentinel two data, so that's the European Space Agency's uh, satellite constellation, which has a pixel size of uh, ten meter by ten meter pixels. Um, so reasonably high resolution, uh, and we can see we've got, uh, what we do is we compare before and after imagery mm -hmm. uh, and use uh, special uh, mathematical transformations called spectral indices. So this one used the, the difference normalized burn ratio, which compares the before and after imagery, um, and it, uh, it's, it results in an index that ties back quite well to, to burn severity. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got before, we've got after, where you can you know, clearly see the fire scar itself. Wow. Um, and then what we do is we take the, the, the difference, the DNBR layer, and then we classify it. 
into kind of groups or categories uh, of burn severity. And that ends up looking like this, where we've got, now we've got three classes here. We've got high, moderate, high, and moderate. Um, I mean, this is just the area in each one of those classes. It looks like the fire was burning. Well, it kind of looks like a valley to me, right? So it was burning like in the lower parts of the valley and then it made its way up with lower lower burn severity. Um, yeah, possibly. I'm not I'm not a hundred percent. I haven't thought about this too deeply, I guess, but uh, uh yeah, it's it's uh I I believe this fire started, you know, in the south area and it kind of burned this way and it burned this yeah. way, but I'm I, I can't say for certain. Um, so the areas in red are obviously the most severely burnt. And then we've got yeah. kind of this 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 orangey and then this this kind of almost white. And you can see actually if you're if you're looking, you can see that we're actually missing some of it. Like this mm. area in here looks like it burnt, um, and and over here as well. Now if you keep your eye on this, you can actually see that if we go back to the before imagery you see how it's kind of a lighter shade of green yeah um that that might have been you know forestry in there or a different type of vegetation uh so this is kind of one of the factors at play in terms of this sort of mapping and how how we need to make this better so we're probably underestimating the burn area here oh, okay. um but but we you know i think we captured the more more severe burning um so um yeah so this this is this is a pretty like i said pretty well established technique for doing this type of thing um but there's often a lot of kind of manual work that feeds into it um so it, it's um you know you might have to pick out where the where the fire extent was and to, to figure out where to grab your imagery you have to figure out you know when the fire started and when it ended probably by looking at the imagery and 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 figuring that out but what we did was we made it actually fairly automatic and we did that by using a second source of satellite data called uh, firms which is the fire information for resource management system and this is provided by nasa uh, so firms actually works on thermal radiation uh, so it essentially detects areas that are hotter hotter than usual and thus you know likely to be on fire um, and firms actually has a very coarse spatial resolution so each pixel is about one square kilometer um, but the advantage that it has is it has a very high revisit frequency so what mm. that means is we can get an image back just about every day from firms mm. so mm. i have a, kind of a slide that's not included in the uh not included in here but shows what it means here is that you, this is kind of the the firm's daily time series this isn't mm -hmm. every day but shows the idea right we so every time what we did was that every time one of these pixels was illuminated we would record it and then we would create these coherent kind of groupings of the fire pixels sorry mm -hmm. just, just see the way that looks and then what we would do is we would buffer them out to make sure we were capturing the full area. Mm -hmm. And that is what we would use to define uh, our, our image search window, basically. So what we would use to grab our Sentinel-2 data. Now mm -hmm. the other thing we get out of this is we get, um, we get the daily time series so we can actually detect within each one of these fire regions or we can say uh, when the earliest burn was detected and when the latest burn was detected. And then we mm -hmm. use that to figure out, uh, to define the, the the time window, which we use to grab our before imagery and our after imagery. So we grab imagery before the earliest fire burn date, and we would grab imagery after the latest fire burn date, basically. So I'm going to take a step back sure. and re-explain, or explain it the way that I, the way that I understand it dumb it down a little bit. So we're looking at, we're just looking at satellite. We're just looking at imagery from mm -hmm. NASA satellites that are going around the planet every day. And they're just yep. looking for heat signatures on, on the globe, on the planet. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And then, yep. and then we're using that data, that map to uh, be able to figure out whether or not there's a fire occurring 
in our area or in this area, and then we use that kind of like as a bounding box, bounding box or a boundary to be able to to then go back to the Sentinel data and say, okay, this is where we want to be looking. And when when did this occur? What's the date? And then we can look at the before and after. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So so I it's possible to uh, do this type of analysis by manually looking at Sentinel two imagery and just like you know, like you can get previews of the imagery over a particular area, or maybe you know that a fire occurred in an area. So then you can say, take a look at the imagery and, and see when it didn't look burnt, and then look later and see when it does look burnt, and you select mm. those images. But um, what, you know, that's a fairly manual process. So there's quite a few fires here. You take some time to do that. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing is, uh, on the other hand, it's possible you could use this firm's data directly to say there's your fire map, but you can see it's pretty crude resolution, right? Yeah. So, so uh, this is kind of a data synergy, I guess, where we're taking two different sources of data uh, that, and leveraging the strengths of each one in order to mm -hmm. make kind of a, a a mostly automatic mapping process. Hmm. Very cool. So we've got, I'm not going to go through all these fires, um, but yeah, sure. obviously people can check them out, but there were quite a few large fires <laughs> that, that we that we were able to see. Uh, so I'll just kind of skip to the end here. Uh, all right, so again, kind of zooming, zooming back out. Um, in physical geography, there's this concept of a river basin. Um, so a basin is just uh, basically defining, you know, if I were to have a drop of water that falls anywhere within this green area, then uh, chances are it would eventually work its way uh, just through gravity to this river here, mm -hmm. which would then eventually drain out into the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got two major river basins that were shown here. We've got the Fraser River Basin, which is this big one here, and we've got the Thompson River Basin. And this is the Thompson River and it's showing the flow direction. Um, and this is the Fraser River showing the flow direction. Um, and so what we what we see uh, here is that a lot of these fires were in the Thompson River Basin. Mm -hmm. um, and as such, we would think that you know if there is an issue with wildfires enhancing flood risk, we would expect it to be demonstrated within the Thompson Basin mostly. Although the Thompson eventually flows into the Fraser, so that's you know a possible, you know, you could expect some some damage uh, along the Fraser River as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so the raging we'll, Fraser. Is yeah. that what they call it? I'm not sure actually. <laughs> That's I've heard. If I would recommend anyone who visits British Columbia to drive up through Vancouver, like through Hope up to Lillooet, it's uh, incredible. It's pretty pretty wild to see how big the Fraser River really is. Yeah, it's 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 an incredible body of water. Yeah. So obviously we. I think you're breaking up. I think. I think uh, there. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. Okay. Yeah, my headset has a mute on it, and it just randomly is muting me. So that's fun. <laughs> uh, so uh, you know, we we had the fires. Obviously, we had the heat dome. We had the fires, and then we had this atmospheric river. So massive uh, rainfall event in November. So it was a pretty bad year, obviously. Um, so this atmospheric river is just this narrow band of of uh, very moist air that you can see in this this time lapse image here, um, and you can actually see in our data here. This is kind of a path of the atmospheric river. Um, the data we're looking at here is is kind of a, a satellite based radar, uh, and it's used to estimate rainfall. And this is actually like cumulative rainfall um, between November 11th and 16th. But actually, most of the rainfall fell in two days, so between the 14th and 15th. And it's colorized on a gradient color scheme. So what what that means is that areas that are kind of darker and darker purple, it had you know less 
rainfall during that period. And then areas that are brighter and brighter, closer to white, um, had more rainfall. And mm -hmm. like the, the, the extent is like, like white would equal 300 plus millimeters, basically. So, so it really hit Seattle, Portland, a little bit of Victoria and Hope. That's, yeah, that's where yeah. it's most concentrated. See, based on this data, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so um, if we zoom in, like you said, uh, we can see that in terms of, of BC, certainly kind of a, the, the center of, of major rainfall was around this Hope area that's just kind of to the to the east of Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, so and this event caused a lot of damage on major highways. Uh, and thankfully, uh, you know, very, very usefully, the, uh, the BC Ministry of Transportation um, has a bunch of photos that they, that they took of the different damage locations and their work on them. And many of them are, are uh, geotagged, so they have spatial information. And so we can actually plot out, we can map where those locations are. And that's what these, these red dots are on the map. Mm -hmm. So in total, we mapped 36 different locations. Uh, and the rest of this story map really focuses on, on you know, looking at them in detail and, and seeing how they might be linked back to the fires. And, and to add context to this, because I don't think we're going to touch base on the Sumas flooding, right? Probably not, no. Yeah, yeah. so th but this is when like a big part of Abbotsford was flooded. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just yeah, I just want to add that for context. Like this, this atmospheric river came in, it flooded a small, <laughs> a farming town near me. I'm in Delta hmm. and also caused all these different uh, mudslides and floods in, uh, in different areas. Yeah, it was, it was a, a pretty big deal, this whole thing. Uh, yeah, and with with uh, and I don't think we fully fully realized all the consequences of it yet. Um, and in that Abbotsford one, I mean, we do have another blog post up about it, but it, it's yeah. very interesting as well. And that actually was like, uh, instead of being caused by direct rainfall, it actually was caused by there's a river in uh, in northern Washington that mm -hmm. kind of overtopped its banks and it flowed across the border into that area. So uh different different factors at play although all driven by the same event right yeah so um just kind of zooming in here uh taking a look first at the the coquihalla highway so this this is like one of the major transport corridors uh to and from vancouver uh it's critical for for movement of goods and people uh into the and out of the lower mainland um and and there was quite a bit of damage that was uh, mapped on that that uh, stretch of road. Now returning to the basin idea here, we can see that actually there's there's this divide that occurs here, mm. um, where we've got so south of the divide, this is the Coquihalla River, and it flows along, and you can see it at certain points it kind of parallels uh, the road, and then it joins up with the Fraser around Hope. Um, and north of the divide, we've got what's called the Coldwater River, which flows generally north and eventually mm. meets up with the Thompson River. And so- oh, right. So it's, they're, they're flowing opposite direction. Yeah, yep. Oh, weird. I've driven down this road and I've never, uh, never realized that. I'll have to check that out next time. I'll have to check out the Coquihalla Summit. Uh, that's, that's where the, the divide occurs. Uh, and likewise, I mean, I've driven on it and I, I never observed that, but, um, so if we, if we're just focused on the North part of the road here, we can see, uh, here we have this July mountain fire. And so it was right beside the highway, really it burned right up to it, burned right up to the river, um, mm -hmm. on both sides in certain places. And it's, you know, directly beside a lot of the road damage um and so you know uh, again going back to our our hypothesis here that uh the the fire was contributing what would happen here would be 
uh, the rain would be falling uh, on this fire scar and rather than being absorbed, it would run off into, you know, uh, through a variety of pathways, it would run off into this cold water river. Mm-hmm. And the cold water river, which passes, you know, the, the road passes near it and it passes over top of it. Um, and so the high flow in that river uh, would be the source of the damage here. And that's, you know, pretty much what we see is that uh, all of the damage is in proximity of the river. Mm-hmm. So if we take a look just kind of quickly through these these locations, this one obviously... Uh, you, you muted yourself again, Gordon. You, you're, you're mute. All right, so I'm just going to talk while you figure out your mute thing for a second. So to to kind of reiterate, um, it's very clear that where there were fires in a near a river basin that went during this atmospheric river, there were multiple like multiple mudslides or just uh, infrastructure damage a lot like near these areas. So that's kind of what we're getting at, and then we're gonna. Gordon's going to showcase the specific road damage that we got from Transport Canada. Yeah. Can you hear me again? Yeah, I can hear you now. Of course, my internet starts failing when we're recording. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so this, this I don't know when I, when I lost you, but um, this, this uh, damage here was upstream of the, of the uh, fire, and so you can't really attribute that to the fire itself. Mm-hmm. But some other locations, like here, certainly, uh, where there's this kind of uh, stream here uh, where a bridge passes uh, over top of that stream that contributes to the, the cold water river that's here. Um, and we can see that there is a bridge, out, bridge outage there. So you can imagine water running off of this slope and into that stream and then mm-hmm. that damaging the bridge. Another Bridge outage here, same idea, right? Bridge is uh, at risk from high flows from the river and they're eroding its underlying structure. Mm-hmm. And here we've got, you know, a washout section of the road. And I like this picture because you can see the fire scar just in the background there, right? Yeah, it's kind of hard to see, but yeah, it's very, uh, <laughs> the whole, basically the entire center of the road is missing. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. <laughs> Wow. And then just, you know, another another washout. Uh, this bridge didn't get taken out, but it was, you know, eroded around and damaged. Yeah. And this isn't actually on the Coquihalla, but it's near it, and it's over top of uh, the Cold Water River. Um, and this is just a bridge that got taken out. This is obviously them repairing the bridge. That was the photo that was taken. So you can, you can kind of see that it's, um, you know, this section was taken out. And yeah, I Sorry, the pictures probably show up kind of small in the presentation. It's easier yeah. if you look at this in on your own browser, you can kind of see see the pictures in more detail. Yeah, for sure. So the Coldwater River flowed, you know, the high flows of the Coldwater River actually flew in, flow, flew, flowed into the town of Merritt uh, and uh, actually extensively flooded it. They evacuated the entire town. Wow. Um, so that was that was a pretty pretty big deal there. Um, so the next road we wanted to look at was the, the Nicola Highway. It was the Highway 8. Um, so you can see the Coldwater River joins uh, the Nicola River here at Merritt. And then that's what this is. This is the, the Nicola River. And it flows along this way um, until it joins with the Thompson River at this place called Spence's Bridge. Mm-hmm. Which then and flows back into the Fraser. Which flows into the Fraser exactly. Um, so, so actually, tons of damage along this Highway Eight. So this Highway Eight runs pretty much parallel to the Nicola River, um, and just a lot of washouts and um, some ridge outages, but mostly just sections of the river or sections of the road um, that were taken out 
uh, washed away by the river. And, uh, you know, definitely we have this cold water river that flows directly into here. You could blame all of this damage on stuff happening upstream, but you will note that the Lytton Creek wildfire scar is right here, mm -hmm. right, and occurs next to the majority of the damage that we mapped. Um, and so it's, uh, you can imagine that in addition to the, the water coming from the cold water river, we mm -hmm. would have had, uh, we would have had water running, you know, falling, rain falling directly on this and running off into the river. And that would do two things. It would uh, just increase the amount of water in that river. And the other thing is it could, you know, the, the water flowing down slope uh, could directly erode the river banks. Uh, and so that could be a contributing factor as well. Yeah. Hey, you're basically being hit by multiple, multiple angles. You have this giant river that's flowing through, there's more water coming through than ever before. And then you have the water that's coming in from the side of the mountains because they're faster than ever before, because there's been, uh, uh, there, there are burn scars. So it's really just a recipe for, for a natural disaster. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it, it's, it's multiple factors, right? And I'll, mm -hmm. I'll stress this later too, but like, uh, you know, this, this certainly is not a one-to-one, -one, you know, burn scar equals flood damage or equals road damage. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's cumulative. Seems, yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's one of the main, the, I think that's the main goal of telling this story is because it, it's, people have this idea it's it's hard to get i think in general with climate change people just think you know it's it, there's a one-to-one -one thing yeah yeah it, it's it's snowing less because it's hotter or um you know there's all these very simple uh uh reasons that people tell themselves this is happening but at the end of the day it's it's commu it's i can't say the word anymore it's cumulative it's it, it keeps building on itself it gets bigger and more yeah. extreme every year and uh it's hard to tell that story, you know, in an article or a, a little, a little heading. Um, but that is, that is really what's happening. And this is such a good way to explain it. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's exactly as you say, it's a cumulative effects and it's, and it's even hard to, to say, you know, like that, the atmospheric river, uh, this, is, this is not a new phenomenon that's been happening, you know, for, for ages. Um, yeah it's just you know we have these seemingly increasing frequency of these uh, very severe events and and it does you know uh, intuitively it feels as if something has changed but um you do have to be careful with these things too because you can't you know uh, just because it seems to our kind of common experience a certain way you know science might point in a different direction but mm -hmm. I, I i think for the most part um i'm not a climate scientist but I think for the most part, people are on board with the fact that while this atmospheric river was, you know, a phenomenon that may have occurred regardless, um, climate change very likely enhanced it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, you know, the heat dome as well. So a lot of the damage along this highway is this type of thing where we've just got you know, sections that are washed away and I'll try and kind of skip through this, um, you know, uh, obviously people, people watching can check out the, the map itself and, and spend however much time they want looking at it. Um, but, you know, just drawing the attention to the fact that this is, you know, we've got these er erosion occurring. A lot of the damage was along these, these meanders in the river. Mm -hmm. So there's where, where the road is, passes very close to a bend in the stream. And then the, the river is coming along and it's there's very strong erosion in this location so that's uh probably where a lot of this is coming from but and a lot of this stuff is it, a lot of stuff is newer infrastructure too like i've driven down these roads and you are pretty close to the river and it is a little <laughs> it's a little suspect at times but mm -hmm. um they might i mean it can't be older than 10 years 15 years maybe oh really it looks okay yeah at least from from what i can tell it looks like fairly new maybe not in this specific area but these aren't like old roads that need right. to be worked on <laughs> yeah no it's 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 probably just the 
you know, any 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 strength of road infrastructure in that area would probably be put to the test by these yeah. circumstances, right? Yeah. So I'll just kind of quickly hop through this, but it's a lot of the same thing, right? You know, yeah. just, just flooding, sections and slides. missing. It's it's actually incredible to me that um, not, I don't know if this sac this uh, highway is open again, but I know that the Coquihalla is wow. open again, and it's you know hats off to the people that worked on that because uh, just 100%. Yeah. I I can't imagine dealing <laughs> they with worked this. quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, they had to, right, to get uh, the Vancouver was cut off from the rest of Canada for a time. Um yeah. which is obviously a disaster for the Canadian economy. Yeah. So we had some bridge outages, you know, both sides of this bridge here got taken uh, out. Um, this is crazy. This is crazy people. Look at that. Yeah. That yeah, is just pretty, uh, pretty wild. That, that is a bridge that has just been cut. Yep. In half. Like a pretty robust looking bridge. I mean, yeah. I'm I'm not an engineer, but uh wow. so that's Nicholas Highway. Uh Trans Canada Highway is uh Highway One. It's a major highway connecting all of Canada. And uh this is the Thompson River coming down, and and we see that uh, we had some damage uh kind of parallel to the thompson river here uh and then there's the fraser river the thompson joins up with and we had one damage location down there mm -hmm. um so what's interesting about the damage here is that um everything that we've seen so far we can reasonably attribute to um to high flows in the river it's all you know uh, bridge outages and 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 road washouts associated with high flows in in the uh in the river so it's you know the 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 burn scar is probably contributing to that but it's uh somewhat indirect what's interesting about the damage in here is that it all appears to be from uh like water and debris flows from the slopes above the mm -hmm. road not mm -hmm. from not from the uh river itself so if we mm -hmm. kind of zoom in and they, i mean obviously we've got you know still the litten fire we've got the molecum uh saying that wrong probably but uh molecum creek wildfire down here uh and all of these damage locations are next to next to the fire so you can i feel like this damage more directly can be tied back to the fire just because you can imagine uh water uh, running off of that burn scar quite rapidly and and uh you know washing out these sections of the road mm -hmm. i'll show you what i mean so we've got this area here where we had a number of bridges this is them being repaired but these bridges were taken out um and that would be uh all from water flowing down this stream channel you can see in blue uh, yeah. and intercepting that area there so obviously burn scar everywhere. As I said before, we're very likely underestimating the burning. So there's probably burning in these areas here as well. Mm -hmm. And so that all would contribute to creating, you know, everything within this area. This is like a mini, uh, a mini river basin. Everything is collects into this outlet that eventually flows into the Fraser here. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's, it's sorry, the Thompson and uh, it's, uh, just wiping out those bridges is kind of pushing them out of the way this is probably very hard to see but this is you know obviously a, almost a pre-existing depression in this in this uh in this uh landscape and it mm -hmm. kind of created a mudslide that covered the highway yeah this one is just <laughs> i mean it's Whoa, just that crazy looks to look like at. wow yeah so this is an underpass underneath the underneath the uh uh, the railway here and again it's flowing it, down here probably and just wiping it out right that is a, that's a lot of land <laughs> yeah to, just pushed out right pushed out to the river yeah it's wow. crazy crazy to look at this <laughs> is not easy to figure out a spatial context but this is uh you know another kind of see. situation where it's probably flowed down from here and just pushed out the section of highway and finally move over here and again just like 
uh, you, I mean, you can see uh, this would have been a huge amount of water flowing down from the mountain above, which is affected by the burn scar. Um, and uh, just uh, none of this uh, is damage that's caused by high flows in the river. It's all water flowing downhill. So um, obviously, you know, in the interest of, of not presenting a biased view here or as as little biased as possible um, you know we did have uh, areas that we couldn't really tie back to mm -hmm. fire damage mm -hmm. um, so a lot of it was around hope but there's also these two locations up around Lillouette here so if mm -hmm. I look at down at hope we see uh, I talked about this before but we have uh, damage on the Coquihalla again in mm -hmm. this Fraser Basin. So there's no burn scars that we found in this area, at least no recent ones. Um, but there was a lot of rain coming down. But there was a lot of rain. So there yeah. you go. You're getting, you're, you're, you're jumping to the next. You're just like a predicting it. Um, <laughs> but, Figuring it out. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, exactly what you said. Um, this was, you know, the epicenter of, of rainfall. And so yeah. I think it's reasonable to say that any infrastructure would be tested by that yeah. amount of rain. Um, and you don't need a burn scar for that to be true. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we, we uh, I mean, that's to my mind, looking at it, uh, there's probably other factors, other factors though at play that I think uh, uh, this, I haven't quantified this, but it seems to me that the mountains in this area are taller and steeper than mm -hmm. some of the other areas we looked at. And again, You've got water flowing downhill. Um, steeper mountains are going to have faster moving water. Less of it's going to get absorbed. More mm -hmm. of it's going to end up in the river. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to be moving faster, so that's more damaging, right? And we see, you know, washouts from the streams above and a lot of bridge outages in this area. It's honestly saying a lot. When you, if people take the time to drive down these roads, <clears throat> it is, it's essentially a, a uh, it's a rainforest. There are, hundreds of millions of dense trees in this area just in a very it's very steep though mm -hmm. so i can only imagine if there were fires in this area followed with uh with uh, a lot of rain how much damage that would cause because there's exactly. there's so much yeah. vegetation there already yeah i would probably i mean we we can't say but uh, it seems like it would be you know even worse all else yeah, being equal for sure yeah, but still just a crazy amount of damage. And again, you know, hats off to the people who worked probably day and night to mm -hmm. to fix this this route up. Um and and you know, it was pretty dire. People were stranded in hope and all yeah. kinds of bad stuff happening. This is the Crow's Nest Highway, so it was a different one, but we had one damaged location here, and it looks like there's this creek here that's kind of running, and it actually I think flows underneath the road typically and it just you know flew or flowed over top oh, of it yeah. basically yeah wow. um you know over closer to uh you know kind of abbotsford area uh we got a landslide that covered the road here and you can mm -hmm. even see on the base map there's this blue line indicating that this is like a major you know this is where water collects and flows down so mm -hmm. you can expect that in addition to the huge amount of rain happening um same kind of idea this one's very unclear to see but there's some some basically mud slides covering the road here okay. uh, and again fairly tall mountains in this area so i'm gonna you know wrap up looking at these locations up north uh so you can see that there's burn scar here so we did map a fire near Lillouette, and you could say that that might have contributed, but the damage that we saw in this area is not really tied back to high flows in the Fraser River here. Um, and that area is already pretty, uh, <clears throat> it's almost desert-like in that area. There are There isn't a lot of vegetation. Oh, okay. Was, yeah, I'm not, yeah. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, as familiar with the local local geography, spent, so that's interesting. Yeah, I spent a lot of time up there, and uh, once you get up past Lillooet, it's almost like it's 
it's almost desert like it's sort of like Kamloops and there are a lot fewer trees fascinating uh, so I think that landscape probably is already used to you know have if there's a lot of water it, it probably already sort it's already sorted itself out and it's used to not having a lot of uh uh trees that will absorb uh the rain right. water uh, yeah so uh, yeah there was there was uh, just looking at this um uh we can't point at it like the pope right and be like oh well it was just a ton of rain there really wasn't i mean there's probably a lot of rain in this area but not compared to hope over here this location uh there was more rain um but again it's not not exactly comparable to hope so uh, there's something else going on here we think um and so if we zoom in on this one uh we can see that it was a rock slide that covered covered the road there mm -hmm. and so not tied back to the river in fact this looks quite to be quite high above the river um but what we can see is we've got basically this little mini catchment that's uh, uh outflowing this way right where the damage occurred right so this is like a, a you know steep mountain but we've got a bunch of water would have collected in here and then that could have led to the slide um but if we look at the satellite uh this is a high resolution satellite base map and this again spells out you know this is like uh steep terrain where mm -hmm. we've got uh water collecting in basically a funnel and then outflowing this way but if you look at it you can see that uh, this is this is obviously not imagery from from 2021 uh and yet it looks like there's been slides at this area before yeah and so there's some evidence on the landscape that suggests for whatever reason this might area might be just prone to sliding and so yeah. um uh, you know without getting too too crazy in depth on it it, it does look like there's some pre-existing factors there um and just the last one i wanted to look at uh was this location over here so this is near a place called duffy lake um mm -hmm. and actually this is probably the one of the more infamous uh road damage locations because there actually was some fatalities here um there was a slide that covered the road and unfortunately it it pushed some vehicles into the river um now again you know we can see that this is up steep area um and there was there was you know significant rainfall here um but we're not tying it back to any any recent fires but if we zoom in and look at the the satellite data what we do see is uh there is some evidence some of, of recent logging in the area yeah. and actually more there's even more if you look at kind of this this green area here that's maybe older clear cuts um and, and and there are linkages between um, logging and and landslides uh, in the in the scientific literature. Mm -hmm. So it's obviously hard to uh, hard to disentangle the different factors in this location and you know all the other ones as well. Um, but it does seem like that that might have been a factor here. So I'm just going to wrap up my kind of walk through the story map um but obviously oh yeah <laughs> you got you mute yourself again a am i back you're back okay perfect all right perfect. so um obviously you know what we think that there's some compelling evidence here in terms of linkages between the wildfires and floods and and you know this is not uh you know we're not we're not the first people saying this this is uh Kind of established science at this point um but i'd like to reiterate that you know this is basically a qualitative study we've been looking at you know some some spatial correlations um and we say okay this this damage seems to be nearby to to these fire scars so we can we can imagine that there is uh some linkages there mm -hmm. but you know the, the reality is that these are complex processes there's a lot at play depending on where rain falls uh and and you know the engineering of the road and uh 
you know, there, there's many other factors, you know, slope, etc. Um, and so this is in, in no way meant to be like, uh, you know, wildfires cause the flooding. Uh, I very much would avoid saying that, mm -hmm. um, but but it does it does think demonstrate that there are these these uh, geospatial factors, um, and I think that understanding where these fires are occurring in the landscape and and on a you know and early on too right like it, as, as soon as uh, the fire season concludes really it would be good to have an understanding of where where these fires have occurred um, because the you know these do seem to be you know two disasters that are linked within the same year mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I hope this kind of demonstrates that I hope it demonstrates how geospatial technology can help to assess wildfires but also other factors um, you know that that might help us mitigate uh, some of the, the climate risks that that we're all experiencing because this does appear to be kind of a you know to use the, the phrase a new normal right mm -hmm. we're, we're having to we're having to adapt to to new realities um, and so uh, hopefully you know we can see how how some of us can help us with that um, so I'd just like to say again thanks to the team uh, for their for their contributions to this work uh, it was a lot of uh, very interesting project and I was felt very fortunate to work on it um, and uh, thanks again to uh, to you for listening yeah no this is super interesting um, I guess we'll end it there because we are I think it's been about an hour um, yeah. but I don't necessarily want to have the, the last word but this is uh, super interesting I I <laughs> I am you've made me nervous about the future but also hopeful that uh, you know we're using these types of models this type of technology we can have more preventative measures uh, so that's what I would like to see from you know the community and just everyone if we're able to use this technology to have a better understanding of the risk um in like you know for example the fires all right what's the risk going to look like in six months from now so just having a sh like a shorter term horizon risk assessment of what could happen so that we can we can uh have more preventative measures because uh yeah anyways this is wild and very very interesting yeah thanks very much julian shall we shall we end it there for sure yeah, cool. Thanks for the work, eh? Honestly, this is this is a uh, uh, really good for for Spark Geo and better better than that. Hopefully, better for the world in a way. Hopefully, we get to work with other companies who are aligned with us and want to help with the help on climate impact um, technologies. That's really, I think, the goal of doing these research projects. Yeah, certainly. I, I hope so. And I hope that we can move more in that direction. Yeah, for sure. Cool. All right. Thanks again. All right. Thanks very much.